Hello, everyone. We're just waiting for some people to stream in here, and we'll start shortly. Is this what we see the whole time? Yes. I forget what I was sharing. Were you trying to share your screen? Yeah. Hi, Deb. Ready? Let's get going. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Stephanie. Hi, my name is Jens. And we are the lead research team at Pacific Whale Foundation. So this is our first attempt at a live Q&A. Um, please submit your questions to us. This will be a lot more fun for us if you're Submitting your questions, you can use the comment section just down below here, and we'll get to see those. Or you can submit them in the Facebook event, and we're checking that on the side here as well. So either way. Um, yeah, so please submit your questions. We want to know what you want to hear from us. We, this is your time with the researchers, and we can chat about anything you want. We can talk about whales and dolphins. We can talk about... How we're keeping busy right now. Uh, you can ask Jens for his chocolate chip cookie recipe. He has a really good chocolate chip cookie recipe. Anything that you want. Um, so thanks for joining us. Pacific Whale Foundation is really grateful for your support right now. This is obviously a difficult time for everybody and we've made a shift to a lot of digital programming to keep our outreach um, activities going since we can't be doing in-person outreach right now. Uh, so thanks very much for joining us. So, what do you want to talk about today? Yeah, I think let's just introduce each other first to give everybody an overview of maybe what we do at Pacific Whale Foundation. So, I'm the chief scientist and uh, my main role involves managing the research here in Hawaii. 
And so very fortunate to be studying whales and dolphins here. And our main study species are humpback whales, bottlenose dolphins, spotted dolphins, false killer whales, and spinner dolphins. And you study marine debris as well. That's correct. I also study marine debris. It's the <laughs> less sexy version of marine research, if you will. Um, and I'm Stephanie. My title is Chief Biologist at the Foundation. And uh, recently I've made a shift to focusing on our international research program. So I lead research studies in Australia and I work with research associates that we have in Ecuador. Hi Christina if you're watching and in Chile. Hi to Barbara and Elsa if you're watching. Uh, and I'm also looking for new research opportunities internationally. So um, yeah, that's, that's us and that's what we do. The questions are pouring in. <laughs> Thank you guys for your questions. Uh, which one should we start with? Start at the top. Um, you look beautiful today. Thank you. <laughs> we have instituted formal Fridays to keep ourselves busy on Fridays and so we don't wear sweatpants every day, but um, we're not doing formal Friday just yet. We'll change after this talk is over. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we got a question from Deb about the whale count this year. I can tackle that one. So we have a citizen science program called the Great Whale Count and we also collaborate with the National Marine Sanctuaries Foundation and they have a sanctuary ocean count. So we conduct shore-based counts of humpback whales that are visible uh, three miles from shore. And we do these counts uh, coordinated at the same time and the same day across all the main Hawaiian islands. So there's counts happening on Maui, that's led by Pacific Whale Foundation and the sanctuary ocean count happens on Oahu, Kauai, and the Big Island. A bunch of volunteer citizen scientists sign up for that event and record data on whale sightings. So this, oh thank you, so this year uh, we unfortunately had to cancel the March counts um, due to the timing and everything that happened. It just wasn't safe for us to bring groups of people together of course so we were sad about that but we did do a January and a March whale count. The sightings in January were quite high. Um, we had a great month in January for whale numbers. Uh, we had great um, sightings from our research vessel Ocean Protector and we were really excited to see so many whales returning this year. And I don't know the official number off the top of my head, but whale counts in January were up 134% or something similar to that over January 2019, so over the year prior. The count in February was a, a bit lower, so we had a um, decrease in whale count this February compared to the year prior, compared to February 2019. But that comes with a big caveat because we had pretty poor sighting conditions on the day that we did the count in February this year. Uh, there was a lot of rain, a lot of wind, which makes them, um, there's white caps in the water, so it's really tricky to suss out what's a whale versus what's just wind when it's uh, like that. So we had really bad sighting conditions and um, that gives us um, less confidence in that whale count. It's possible that there were more whales out there than we were able to count that day, but that's just the nature of the project. That's the nature of citizen science. Yeah, it's the nature of doing research in, in the ocean where <laughs> you can't always count on the conditions. So it's the same sort of thing we encounter in the field as well. We can see fewer dolphins when it's windy, and therefore we're trying to get out there when the weather is nice and calm. Yeah, but great questions. And so uh, very topical, maybe this one's for Stephanie, but uh, someone asked if whales can get COVID. Ooh, great question. Hmm. Um, as far as I know, they can't get the COVID-19, the novel coronavirus that's going around right now. I have seen some research that shows that cats and types of cat species uh, can have that disease or it can be carriers of that disease but as far as I know it's restricted to cats um, but I'm not sure if anybody's 
necessarily researching that? That's a really good question. Yeah, so it's, um, you know, science is many fields working together, and so this is a very specialized field of, of pathology, if you will. Um, and so I do, I have seen papers surfacing of coronavirus or evidence of coronavirus in some marine mammals, but um, yeah, not you're outside, this strain, yeah, right? exactly. Not necessarily the strain, but um, yeah, you know, outside of our expertise. So something that we're more familiar in is, uh, you know, what is our coolest thing we've encountered out in the field? I think we can each answer that with a lot of confidence. Um, for me, it was sort of when I first started here at Pacific Whale Foundation almost seven years ago now. We were doing surveys off the backside of the island of Lanai, um, where water has reached depths of three to 4,000 um, feet quite rapidly. And we came across this large drifting net. And it had obviously been there for a while because there's a whole community of marine life around it. So if you looked at the net itself, you had crabs, algae growing on it, little mussels. And then around the net in the ocean itself were small reef fish. Further out from that were turtles. Further out from that were sharks. And of course, larger um, oceanic um, fish species that were moving along with this net in this little ecosystem. And it was really a neat encounter to, to see how you know primary succession in the ocean might work with marine debris, which is you know a bit disheartening. But it really shows the challenge of we can't just pull that net out and then remove the entire ecosystem, you really need to replace it with something else that's organic, for example, a palm frond or, or some natural piece of debris because it does serve a purpose for those species around it. But really cool encounter. You know, it's not very often you can see all those things from the research boat. Uh, we did pull out some photos and videos to share with you guys today and cannot figure out how to share them with you while we're streaming on YouTube. So we're still kind of looking at the computer set up here and trying to figure out if someone knows how we can do that, just write it in the comment section for us. Otherwise, um, we can just describe those stories to you and you'll have to use your imagination. Um, one of my coolest things that I've seen on a field day, I am working on a little um, video blog post for you with this footage, so I won't share it today. but. Recently, it was one of our last field days of this season. It was, I believe, in March. And we got a call. We were in the office, and we got a call uh, from some boats saying, I think we see a mom with two calves. Do you guys want to come out and check this out? And Jens and I looked at each other and said, heck yeah, we want to check that out. Um, because that's a question that whale researchers are curious about, is, is it possible for a whale to have calves? As far as we know, it's not. That's been documented in utero, so we've seen two fetuses um, from the whaling era, but no one's ever seen two live calves from a whale. Um, so we were really interested in this. Mm, what's going on out there? I'd like to go check it out. So we, um, it was in Ma'alaya Bay, so it was a really short 10-minute drive for us, so we hopped on the research boat, drove out to see what was going on, and it was chaos. It was a really interesting day for us and it was very confusing for us because there was a competition pod. So a competition pod is a group of male, usually whales, that's uh, chasing and being really aggressive with each other. And there's usually one female whale at the front of the group. And those males are looking for an opportunity to mate with that female. So it's really exciting. They're really active at the surface. Um, and in the midst of that, there was a mom with a calf, and there seemed to be a second calf. We stayed and observed them for a couple of hours, and what we could suss out was that it wasn't a mom with twins. It, had, it was a mom with a calf, and then probably a separate calf that had um, got separated from its mom. We didn't see its mom, so we have no idea if she was alive or not. Um, but separated calves do happen. And it seemed like this way, this calf was trying to associate with the mom who had another calf. The mom with the other calf was leading that second separated calf towards this comp group, probably to use them as a shield and distract and get away from that um, calf because energetically, a humpback whale probably doesn't have the 
energy reserve to nurse two calves. That would be a really huge uh, investment of energy from that mom. So it was total chaos. There was this competition group of maybe 10 whales that was just circling around Ma'alaya Bay, lots of activity, lots of action. And in amongst it, this mom with a calf and this other lone calf that was chasing them around. Um, so I will share some of that footage with you. You won't see it today, unfortunately, but I will make sure that we post it online and you'll get to see it. It was really, really interesting event for us and really, um, we see something new all the time. You know, it was my seventh year here at Maui doing whale research and I've never seen anything like it. Yeah, and just, you know, um, credit to Captain Aaron who called in that sighting for sure. Um, and we do rely on Pack Whale Eco Adventures quite often to report those kinds of sightings to us. So it's really, you know, the on water community that's helping us out with those things. And I think we can hit two questions with one stone here as far as, you know, do we respond to entanglements and have we heard of any false killer whale sightings um, mm -hmm. lately? And so, you know, those really do tie into initial reports that come into uh, the research department or to Ed Lyman at the sanctuary. Um, from the on-water community and so we're out there as much as we can but you know uh, tour groups such as Pack Whale Eco Adventures is out there 365 days a year so they're great eyes on the water normally. for us. Normally. <laughs> for sure. Uh, of course nobody's out there right now. Um, so do we help out with tangled whales? Yes we do. Um, we do not lead that program. This is led by the sanctuary so the Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary and it's led by Ed Lyman over there. He's a great guy. And so we've been involved with the program almost six years now, and we are what is considered a rapid response or first response vessel. Uh, we operate out of Ma'alaya and are able to do some initial assessments um, for Ed Lyman on entangled whales if we're out on the water and able to get there relatively quickly while Ed assembles the team. And we also are part of the team that Ed assembles um, to join on the sanctuary vessel where the bulk of the disentanglement um, efforts or the entanglement response itself takes place. And so we're certainly excited to be part of that team. To the, this year was actually a really low year for entanglements. So that's you know exciting to hear, but uh, not sure what that means at this point. Um, but we're happy to be part of that team. Have you heard of any false killer whale sightings recently? Yes, unfortunately. Um, so to backtrack a little bit, false killer whales, they're a species of dolphin that are found in waters all around the world. But one of the populations that's found here in Hawaii, the insular population that's resident to the main Hawaiian islands, that population is listed as endangered and their numbers are quite low. So we study those animals. That's one of our most important research studies that we have going on in Hawaii because there's such a need to learn more about them and their conservation status. So we have been studying them since Jens and I joined the research team in 2013, but unfortunately we didn't have huge numbers of sightings of them. They're relatively rare to see in the Maui waters. We would see them a few times a year, if that. And then for a couple of years in a row, 2015, 2016, I think 2017, we didn't encounter them at all from our research vessel. So it's hard to study something when you can't find it. Um, so in 2018, we started a new research um, study and a new approach to studying false killer whales. We initiated a community rapid response hotline so the hotline is just Jens's cell phone number and um, we're sharing that with ocean users who are on the water in Maui Nui. Uh, fishermen, tour operators, recreational boats, anybody who sees a false killer whale while they're out there in Maui. Um, we would love it if you called us and reported that to the research department. When we get reports that they're around, we'll take our research boat and respond to that sighting. So we'll go out there and try to collect data on them collect photo ID data to identify the individuals that are present. We take location data to look at where they're found and where they're going when they're in Maui Nui. Behavioral observations, so are they traveling, are they feeding? Uh, and recently we started using drones for research as well. So 
when the weather lets us, we will launch our drone and collect some aerial um, photos and videos. And from that, we can collect morphometrics and look at the body condition of individual false killer whales. So some of you might have seen some research that's all over my social media, at least, uh, is some research that's been done on right whales all around the world. And researchers use drones to fly over the right whales and look at body conditions of different populations of right whales. And they're showing just how um, impacted the North Atlantic right whales have been by entanglements in their, in their life history. So those animals are really skinny compared to other right whales around the world. So we're doing a similar program with our false killer whales in Hawaii. We're taking measurements with the drones and looking at their body condition. So we'll relate that then to um, the recovery status. How is that population doing? Um, and the question, I think I gave a very long-winded answer, but the question was, have you had any false killer whale sightings lately? Um, so we're off the water right now. It's just not safe for us to be doing our field work right now because our research boat is small. It's uh, 26 and a half feet and you're supposed to maintain at least six feet in between people and we normally take six or seven people on the boat with us and also just to abide with the most safe thing to do for our team. We decided to stand down for now uh, so we're waiting for it to be a safer time for us to go out and resume our field work but we're really eager to get out there. Um, one of the last days before we all started working from home, we got a call on the hotline. Remember who called you? About false killer whales? Yeah. Uh, a couple of people. I think Captain Doug gave me a ring, and then I'm not sure. Seems like forever ago. <laughs> um, I, I did get some advice on how to get some media working, talking oh. about our field work. Uh, bear with us for a minute here, and I'll Try see if you. I can. Um, share with you guys a field day since we were just talking about that. Are we gonna dive the one I'm over now? So someone write in the comments and let us know if you can see this video or not. We're not totally sure what you're seeing right now. Um but I'll keep talking. So we got that call about false killer whales one of the last days before we completely shut down our operations and started working from home. So um, given everything that was going on at the time, we did not respond. We stood down that day and haven't gotten any phone calls since then. Um, but that doesn't mean they are or aren't out there because not many people are on the water right now. So I'm not too sure if they're around or not. Um, we did see on social media that killer whales, not false killer whales, but real killer whales, orcas, were seen yesterday off the big island. How cool is that? Oh, good. You can see it. Okay. Awesome. Thank you for the comments, guys. <laughs> All right. And so back to some of the first questions. Uh, let's keep some of the footage coming for you guys. Um, some memorable encounters. Here's one of the best muggings that I've ever been a part of, um, as viewed from the air uh, using a drone. And so we are doing research on humpback whales here, of course. Long-term research we've been doing for almost 40 years now. And so our current program or research around humpback whales is a partnership with the University of Hawaii's Marine Mammal Research Program, as well as the Hilo program, looking at the energetic costs of migration between Hawaii and Alaska and seeing how changes in climate and threats and stressors will impact the energy reserves um, that it takes to make that migration from Alaska to Hawaii and so to do that we fly drones over top of humpback whales and gather aerial footage to measure the body um, width all the way down the body and from that we can infer body condition of that animal and health of that individual and then make some inferences on how healthy the population is here that migrates to Hawaii each year from Alaska. The same work going on in Alaska um, again this is a project being led by the Marine Mammal Research Program at the University of Hawaii. So this video is a bit high resolution, looks like it's coming in a bit choppy, but I think mm. you get an idea there of the number of people on the boat and how close that humpback whale was um, to us during this encounter. And we spent almost 40 minutes um, with this humpback whale just going to the left side of the boat to the right side 
or the port and starboard, I guess I should say. <laughs> I just want to say thanks to our team members. You can see them all in the video, but our, you know, you're looking at the two of us right now because we're the ones who design and oversee the research program as a whole, but it takes a village, really. So you'll see on the boat, there's a whole group of people. Our team is um, Grace, Abby, Jessica's in that video. She's moved on to the East Coast now. Um, who else is there? There's Adam Pax on board. There's Adam. Martin. Jens is in his purple shirt, the same shirt he's wearing today. That's oh. funny. <laughs> um, Adam Pack from UH Hilo is there. And Martin. Martin's a PhD student at PhD student, sorry, at UH at Manoa. He's part of the Marine Mammal Research Program. You can see their logo there on the drone case. Um, so it really does take a huge team of people to do this work. It's, it's not just the two of us. I want to make sure that you know it takes a village, and we're really grateful to, to everybody for helping with this work. Okay, let me see some other questions here. Oh, that could be a good segue here. Okay. Do you want to talk about that tagging? Yeah, sure. So, you know, if you guys have been following the media here in Maui, um, you probably saw some footage circulating of um, a calf being tagged with a camera. And so these cameras are mounted uh, via suction cup. So they're suction cupped on the back of that calf and they can stay on. I've seen five minutes to seven, eight hours here in, in Maui when we helped with some of this work this past whale season. Uh, that project is being led by the University of Hawaii, again the Marine Mammal Research Program. They're looking at quantifying the rate of suckling between mums and calves uh, here in Hawaii. And so if you know how much time calves are spending feeding, you can begin to make inferences on um, potential impacts or disruptions to feeding between mums and calves. And so the Pacific Whale Foundation helped out a little bit with that field work, but that was the extent of our involvement with that and that program is run by the University of Hawaii. Do you want to add anything? Um, no, just uh, this was a trial run really of those new cats tags and we're looking forward to continuing to help and support that work next whale season. Uh, that'll be an ongoing project. Uh, it's not our research but we're happy to be involved in it and be supporting them as best we can. Can we say more about the killer whale sighting off Hawaii Island? You know, I can't because I don't know anything about it. Uh, I'm a member of a group on Facebook called Cetal Fauna, and someone posted it in there. It's just a bunch of people who love whales and dolphins, and they post their photos and videos. They post research articles. I just saw someone from Hawaii share it in there, and I asked, when was this? And she said yesterday. Uh, we know that killer whales do sometimes come to Hawaii. They're seen, seems to be mostly off Hawaii Island, um, maybe once or twice a year. It's not something we see on a regular basis, but we know that they do come here. Uh, so you could probably check out that video online. Let's see if I can figure out who posted it for you. Sure. It's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. It's really nice footage. Uh, so we can take another question here. Um, looks like, are you hearing about any unusual marine activity coinciding with our human pause? Um, and the commenter says they're seeing turtles closer to shore and more mm -hmm. spotted eagle rays. Um, so yeah, you sort of, you know, if you're staying in tune uh, online, you're starting to hear these stories of, of how things are changing in the marine world um, with the reduction in, in tourism and local vessel traffic. And so it's a question we've talked about and thrown around here at Pacific Whale Foundation for quite a long time. And so, um, you know, it, it, we haven't, we don't have any researchers out there at this point to look at that question. At this point, the humpback whales have already gone, but another important note. Not all gone. Not all gone, sure. Um, but if we were to do this work, it would have to be from the land and that would require uh, the few humpback whales that are left to come within three miles of the shore so we could effectively gather data on them and accurately record behavioral changes we might be seeing. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is, you know, we're all still being fed here in Hawaii and around the world and so, you know, global shipping traffic is still quite high, a large contributor to the acoustic noise in the ocean. So on the larger scale of things, uh, we might not be seeing huge changes, but on the smaller scale I can definitely see 
some potential changes and, and it'd be interesting to see if any research studies come out of this uh, you know at the end but it really is an unprecedented time that no research organization was ready for and, and mm -hmm. really we're just trying to scramble to see what we can do um, to ensure long-term continuity in our data sets as well because uh, we're unable to study any of the whales and dolphins at this point from our vessel. I will give a little plug to my own blog post that I posted this morning. I wrote a little bit about how does this COVID-19 pandemic affect whales and dolphins. So if you go to pacificwhale.org slash blog, you can read my posts that I uh, wrote earlier today. And thanks, Kelly, for getting that up so quickly. Yeah, so we got another question on, you know, what are the numbers on top of the research boat? And so there's, yeah, there's numbers on the research boat, which is a research permit, and we use that uh, to show that all the activity conducted under that um, vessel is permitted by the National Marine Fisheries Service and allows us uh, various exemptions when we're researching humpback whales and dolphins. But we also have um, numbers 1 through 10, and each one of those number blocks corresponds to 10 centimeters. And it's basically, you know, to simplify, it's a ruler that we put on top of our vessel, and it allows us to calibrate that drone footage I alluded to earlier that we use to measure humpback whales. And so we're using equipment and you know, instruments to measure the height above whales and then converting that um, to a measurement of the whales. I won't get into the details of how that works, but um, we're assuming that everything is working without actually knowing 100% if it is working. So the measurements on the roof allow us to sort of do a quality check of our instruments before we measure the whales. And so if we fly over the research vessel, we can actually measure those 10 centimeter blocks and we should be getting 10 centimeters for each of those uh, numbers. And if we're not, then we know there's something off with our calibration and we wouldn't be able to use the footage there. And so it's, it's a safety check for our data collection using drones. And thanks to the Pacific Whale Foundation graphics team for making those for us and making our boat look so beautiful. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Do you want to show us some more footage? Yeah, let me bring up some I more footage. I did just look up uh, the person who was asking about the killer whales off of Hawaii Island. Uh, it was posted by Kona Divers, an organization called Kona Divers. So if you go to their uh, Facebook page, you can watch that footage. All right, let's see. A breach. See if this works. This is some more drone footage, and it looks like it's a whale breaching. So there's a bit of a. Uh, so this is the work that we do. We're just trying to fly over those humpback whales, uh, get them to surface, and then get a measurement of those humpback whales. And so you'll see the drone pilot here positioning the camera over top of those humpback whales. And then we're trying to get a still, a nice clean shot of the, the full animal in the frame, nicely at the surface. Um, this happens to be an exciting one because about three or four minutes in, uh, mm -hmm. we can actually see how the animals go from a slow travel to a breaching sequence, and you can really see the fluke beats of those humpback whales really speed up as they work to launch themselves out of the water under the drone. So. With a bit of patience, hang in there. We'll keep chatting. Um, I think this is more exciting to look at than our living room. So uh, <laughs> enjoy the footage and, and know that there's some breaching coming here in a few minutes. Maybe you can talk about why whales breach. It's a good question. So yeah, I'll give the science answer, which is I don't know. There's various <laughs> theories, and, and I'll speak to some of those. And if I miss any, you can sort of fill those in. The one that I tend to prefer, or the one that I, I like to give, um, is that whales breach to dislodge parasites or shed skin um, because there's a large amount of force exerted on the external body of the humpback whale when it breaches. And so uh, if you drive through an area that a humpback whale has just breached, it's often a little bit smelly. Um, and you can see sloughed off skin and sometimes even barnacles, for example, that have fallen off as a result of the impact of the whale landing in the water. Um, there's been some recent research looking at humpback whale calves and comparing active and non-active calves. And uh, they can see from uh, the levels of hemoglobin in the blood that uh, breaching calves have higher concentrations of that. And so that 
um, could allude to a sense of you know it's exercise for the whales or the calves uh, so they can make that long migration back to Alaska because that's the ultimate goal of that mama calf is to have enough energy and enough muscles to to make that big journey. Any theories you like on breaching? Oh, sorry, I um, actually was reading comments that were coming in. What did you cover? Parasite communication? A, no, not communication. Oh, so communication is another um, possible explanation as to why whales breach. So if you've ever been on a whale watch boat and you've seen whales breach, you can often hear the whales breach as well as they hit the water, they make a really loud slapping sound. And that's likely some form of long range communication, just like everything else that the humpback whales do where they slap the surface of the water. So tail slaps, pectoral slaps. Um, those are all some thought to be some form of communication, but we don't really know what it is they're trying to communicate. Um, we have a really good question about drones and drone footage. So as we're watching this amazing footage, I do want to make sure to say that all this work is carried out under a research permit and also FAA authorization. So it is against the Marine Mammal Protection Act to fly a drone over humpback whales in Hawaii. Um, humpback whales have special protections under the MMPA, so a lot of people know there's an approach distance of 100 yards, but there's also an aerial approach distance. So all aircraft, whether it's a helicopter or a plane or a drone, they're all lumped together in the same way right now. Ooh, there's a, there it is. So legally, drones are considered aircraft right now, and aircraft have a 1,000 feet aerial approach distance that they have to follow. But if you're a recreational drone operator, you know that you can't fly that high. Drone operators can't fly more than 300 feet. Bubble Three or 400 feet. No, no, airspace. 400 feet. 400 feet. I should know this. <laughs> um, so because you can't go higher than um, the minimum altitude that you can legally stay over a whale, essentially there is no legal way that drone operators can fly over whales in Hawaii. Um, unfortunately, we see a lot of people breaking that rule and posting footage on social media or we see them just on the cliff sides of flying their drone over whales. I think it's really just an educational matter. So when we tell people, hey, did you know that the whales are protected under the MMPA and there's a altitude restriction? Most of the time people have no idea and they're very apologetic and they don't want to do any harm to the whales. So uh, most people really understand that there is a potential to disturb whales from flying drones over them. Um, but research activities, you know, we're operating under a permit that allows us permission to do these things because we have to do it this way in order to get the data we need to then um, help conserve and manage these populations. So it's a bit of a trade-off for researchers, for sure. Did you talk about the height we fly at? Oh, no. Go ahead. Yeah, so the footage you're seeing here is right around 25 meters. Um, some non Canadians can convert that, but uh, that's that's where we're flying at, and that allows us to get um, a full frame of, of the animals in the video, uh, but it also allows us the resolution we need to um, conduct the measurements. Yeah. So enjoy this footage. Um, we all wish we were out in the field right now doing this kind of work. But a lot of people ask us, well, if you're not in the field and if you're not allowed to do your field work right now, what do you guys do? What does research uh, mean when you're not able to go out on the water? That's an excellent question. And um, I thought we could talk a little bit about that, what we've been doing while we're working from home or what keeps us busy. Um, also, we had in the Facebook event, some people said they wanted to talk about careers in marine science. So if you have questions for us about that, just um, write them down in the live chat and we'll be able to answer your questions. What's this video, Jen? Oh, just more beautiful whales. <laughs> Close to the boat. And, yeah, just Fair keep enough. you guys entertained while we chat away. So uh, I'm very happy to have just had
had a paper accepted this week actually, so yay us. Um, and we wrote a paper about spinner dolphins in Hawaii. I think we have some spinner dolphin footage we can show you next. But so spinner dolphins in Hawaii, it's pretty well established at this point that they're under enormous tourism pressure uh, from swimmers who go to swim with them in the daytime, or from vessels um, getting close, or just vessel traffic. The spinner dolphins, they go offshore and hunt at night, and then during the daytime hours, they're very predictable, and they will come into the same areas, usually in the daytime hours, and rest very close to shore. So they're an easy target, really, for human activities. And uh, we know that this is a problem. And because of that, the federal management agency, NOAA Fisheries, has decided they want to add some enhanced, um, what's the word, enhanced management or enhanced uh, measures to further protect the, oh, got it, to further protect the spinner dolphins throughout the main Hawaiian islands. Um, but there just isn't enough research right now to guide what exactly they should put into place. So they've weighed a few different options. They've weighed closing certain bays to boat traffic during the resting hours. They've weighed uh, adding an approach distance to spinner dolphins, just like we have for humpback whales. But there isn't enough data, especially from the other islands like Maui, Oahu, Kauai, uh, to really guide that decision making. So that's the paper that we've just published. We used our data set from the Maui Nui area and we collaborated with researchers at Cascadia Research Collective. So Robin Baird uh, gave us his spinner dolphin data set as well from Maui Nui and we mapped where spinner dolphins spend their time and the amount of interchange between the areas where they spend their time to look at are certain areas more important to spinner dolphins and we can use that uh, data then to guide the decision-making process of what rule actually makes sense for NOAA fisheries to implement. So it's really important work. Uh, I'm really proud of that project and uh, this little pause was very helpful to me really in giving me the time to get that done. Excellent, yeah. So we've got some feedback on, on video audio and it's being hard mm -hmm. to hear. So. Sorry we got carried away with that, but uh, there's a couple more questions that came in, so I'd like to address those. A couple around GoPros, and um, so I'll just read it out. Considering GoPros can be potentially just as invasive as a drone, vessel, mm -hmm. or human, which all have regulations, are the regulations on sticking a GoPro in the water when whales are around? So um, the short answer is there's no specific regulation for a GoPro. Uh, the regulation is you as a person or an individual are not allowed to put yourself closer than a hundred yards to that humpback whale and so that's probably what i'm going to leave it at because that's as clear as i can make it because that's as clear as it is for us so um yeah the law involves not putting yourself closer than a hundred yards um but I will add on to that. So that's for members of the public. The footage that we're showing you is, again, collected under a research authorization. So under our research permits, we have to detail all the different techniques that we're going to use in the field. Um, aerial with the drone is one of them, and underwater footage is separately listed as a data collection technique on our research permit. So we do have authorization to put the GoPro in the water that way. Do you want to talk about the paper that you've been working on lately? Uh, yeah, for those who aren't, I guess, who are interested in marine debris as well. So, you know, it's work that we've been carrying on here for five years. And uh, so we're working on looking at some of the impacts of policies that have been passed here in Maui. And in 2014, they passed a law or policy that banned the use of tobacco products from Maui County beaches, parks, and recreational areas. And with the hopes that it would eliminate the cigarette butt filters that are littered quite regularly on those beaches. And so the best I can speak to it now, because it's still in review, is that um, we're not seeing a reduction in the number or the counts of cigarette butts at those beaches um, where the policy has applied. And, you know, it's not surprising since the law has not seen much enforcement. 
to be specific, zero citations have been issued under that um, new policy, and so without enforcement, the policy is very difficult to see become effective when it requires enforcement to be effective. So um, we're looking at other avenues to see a reduction in marine debris on our beaches, but that's a particular one that we're hoping to share with you guys really soon. Uh, so we got a question from Jack. Hi, Jack. Jack wants to know how big can whales get? So we study humpback whales. That's the species that we've been showing you these pictures and videos of. The humpback whales can grow to be about 45 feet long as adults. Uh, when they're born, the calves or the baby whales are about 15 feet long. And um, interestingly, the different populations of humpback whales grow to be slightly different sizes. So I also study humpback whales in the Southern Hemisphere off of Australia. And humpback whales down there grow to be a little larger than they do uh, here in the Hawaii population. Any other um, questions about whales or dolphins, just drop them in the chat and we'll do our best to answer. All right, any new research to... findings on Hawaii's humpback whale population. So I assume um, this is alluding to the reduction or the drop in sightings that occurred here in the 2014-15 season where um, humpback whale sightings uh, anecdotally look to have gone down. And so a lot of researchers, a lot of tour operators and the general public were just seeing fewer whales. And so um, that led to a North Pacific wide collaboration of humpback whale researchers to try and answer that exact question of um, why did this happen and try and quantify um, the degree that it happened. So, um, you know, we're looking at sighting rates and we have anecdotal evidence, uh, but nobody was actively studying the abundance or the exact number of humpback whales that come here each year. And so we w didn't have a data set that specifically answered the question of how much did it decrease, but we do know that the numbers that arrived in Hawaii did decrease and so we're working to answer those questions and um, unfortunately there's no immediate answers at this point on, on what what happened at that time or um, what it was this year all we can speak to is the data that's coming in and, and it's showing that you know the humpback whales that went missing in one year have been since found so they went somewhere else during that year um, from photo identification because we're able to identify individuals um, through their flukes or the undersides of their tails uh, you know we can track individuals and so the ones that had been expected to see in various areas in southeast Alaska that went missing have since been found again and so uh, we're still trying to determine what caused the change in distribution or the change in sighting rates down here and these are just you know some of the many possible explanations to to what happened in that um, I just want to make sure that we mention this before we go. So we have about 10 minutes left and then we're going to have to um, move on. But there are some ways you can help with this research. I want to make sure that we mention that. Um, I see Carl is watching on the chat. Carl is one of our uh, citizen scientists who donates lots of his photos to the research department. So we have a program where we use photo ID to track individual whales and dolphins. And if you have photos of whales or dolphins, really from almost any part of the world, you can send them in to us. So if you go to pacificwhale.org slash donate photos, um, we have a web page where we detail out the criteria for donating your photos to the research program and how to do it. So we're very grateful to the people who contribute as uh, citizen scientists with that program, like Carl, who sends us some false killer whale photos, which we're very grateful for. Uh, but send us your whale photos, send us your dolphin photos. Um, and yeah, those really do help uh, us answer questions about these animals. Other ways people can get involved? Uh, you got it for now. <laughs> <laughs> well, Marine. Okay, I know yes, it's sure, tricky yeah. to do a so, marine debris cleanup right now. Uh, failed prompt, but my bad. Uh, so yeah, sure, we have a citizen science program for um, marine debris monitoring. So uh, we want to make it easy for you guys to do your part for the earth and the oceans. Uh, so you can pick up a cleanup kit, which consists of a bag and a tally sheet. 
to be um, used to clean a beach and tally the items that you're picking up because cleaning is the first step. What we want to do is get to a point where you no longer need to clean those beaches and so to do that we need to know what are the problem items and on what beaches are those problem items and then we can begin to work with management and policy and, and local and federal governments to start to address those real problematic items and, and start to work to reduce those. And so cleaning is great, cleaning and tallying is even better, and then cleaning, tallying, and doing the research is the trifecta that we're going for here. Yes, so you can be a citizen scientist in those ways. That's some ways that if you're at home right now, you can still help us if you're going out for a walk in your neighborhood, you can pick up some debris while you're out walking. Or if you're sitting at home going through some old photos and you discover something that could be useful to us, please send it in. It's also really a huge help to us if you become a member of Pacific Whale Foundation or make a donation to the foundation. So those member dollars go a really long way. We do a lot with a little at our organization and we're doing research across many parts of the world, in Hawaii, in Australia, in Ecuador, blue whale research in Chile. If you want to learn more about the blue whale research in Chile, it's going to be a video interview with the um, two women who are doing that program in Chile. I think it's on the 27th, which is Monday. Check Facebook page. <laughs> yeah, for all these check Pacific Whale Foundation's Facebook page for that event. Um, but we are doing so much. We have education programs, conservation and advocacy work, um, and we can really use your support right now. So to all of you watching, we're really grateful that you're with us during this time and supporting us, and please consider making a small donation. Yeah, very well said. And you know, <laughs> take what you learned today and share it with the community if you're here in Hawaii or uh, wherever you happen to be. You know, We're here for you guys to, to learn, and, and we'll do our best to educate. And we're certainly happy to have you guys all as supporters. Should we end with a little bit of I was going to say, do you have any footage? more footage? Then we'll, we'll call it. If there's no other questions, then yeah, we'll just close. Yeah, I think we've gotten through most of the questions. If anyone has anything, we have just a couple minutes left. What do you think? What should we show them? Oh, spinner dolphins? We haven't shown any dolphins yet. So, so as oh, you can see, uh, you know, they occur in, in big groups, so if we see a large number of dolphins, it's it's a likelihood that's going to be those spinner dolphins because they occur in those larger groups of 50 to 100, sometimes even 200 individuals. And so they're always exciting to study. It certainly makes for um, a busy day of photo identification if you're trying to capture photos of, of all those individuals. Um, but yeah, I think maybe we close it out there. Is there another question? Um, yeah, just some technical question about how... What, what's our setup? What are we using when we do photography and with the drone? Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so we do put polarized filters on, on the camera lenses of the drone. So this isn't your basic off-the-shelf drone. It's um, customized with um, cameras that have been calibrated to specific software that we use to measure those whales. And yeah, we, we do have issues with glare because we're trying to get a nice shot of the uh, perimeter of that humpback whale all the way around so mm -hmm. we do what we can to limit that and you know a large, a large part of that is from the white cap so we try and get those calmer conditions to help with that and um, yeah we certainly try and minimize the glare as well with those polarized filters does anybody know what's in this picture here between us i have a question for you guys who are watching I'll give you a minute to see if anybody wants to make a guess at what's on the wall behind us. Did you show them all the footage? Yes. Okay. We'll close it here with this last trivia question. <laughs> I'll give you a hint. It's something that whales eat. 
I think I might have stumped everyone. Oh, okay, before I answer that, we have a question from Denise. Hi, Denise. And she's asked, do spinner dolphins migrate or reside in one area? That's a really great question. So uh, spinner dolphins and most of the dolphins that we study, uh, well, all of the dolphins that we study, um, they're not migratory species. So humpback whales are migratory in that they travel huge distances between their breeding and feeding grounds each year. But dolphins um, are considered resident, so they live in Hawaii all year round. Getting some guesses now on my question. Uh, so they live in Hawaii all year round, spinner dolphins do. And some genetic work that's been done by the Pacific Island Fishery Science Center has shown that there are genetic differences between the populations or stocks that are found on the different Hawaiian, main Hawaiian islands. So there is a Oahu and Four Islands stock of spinner dolphins. So they are resident to those islands and there is a big island stock. So um, they are different in that they don't move very much between the main Hawaiian islands. So they're considered resident in that sense, but they don't just stay in one bay all the time. They go offshore and hunt or forage in the nighttime and return back to day, uh, back to the shoreline in the daytime. Um, they do, especially on the Kona coast, which is where you're asking about, they do seem to really prefer certain resting areas and return to the same spots over and over, which is part of the problem. That's what makes them a great, easy target for the tour operators. They're very predictable in where they go. Um, so it's good and bad. Okay, so we got some questions, some uh, answers about this. Wait, this. No, oh my gosh. Here, here it is. <laughs> this is a picture of Capelin. Capelin, it's a small schooling fish that this photo is taken uh, where I'm from in Newfoundland, Canada. And uh, Capelin roll in Newfoundland, it's been seen in documentaries all around the world. It's this really unique phenomenon where they come onto shores, these rocky shorelines in the summertime and they spawn on the shore and die there. But the capelin, it's one of the types of schooling fish that humpback whales feed upon. So when we see these fish, we know that the whales are not too far behind. Nice. Do you want to end it on that fact? <laughs> sure, yeah. If you want to learn more, our website is pacificwhale.org. If you want to read any of our research papers, they're all available for free to download on our website, pacificwhale.org slash research slash publications. And um, follow us on social media. We're doing tons of new virtual content for you. I hope you all are enjoying it. We're really enjoying making it for you and sharing with you. Uh, you can follow us on social media or sign up to our mailing list. Uh, on our website and then you'll get notifications of everything that we have coming up for you. Um, what do we have scheduled next? Next week I'm talking with our blue whale researchers um, with Barbara and Elsa from Chile about blue whales and we talk about whale poop which is uh, fun to talk about. Jens well, Yen, picked up a piece of whale poop earlier this year. <laughs> well I didn't. I, I helped retrieve it. Uh, certainly wasn't the one that was collecting it but yeah we, we I was present for the capturing of whale poop off the coast of Maui by hand um, recently and it's currently in in the free, freezer lab at Pacific Whale Foundation <laughs> awaiting analysis but yeah do stay tuned to our Facebook page um, have a look at that and if anybody's interested in careers in marine science um, there's a series going on now that's being read by Robin um, Ehrlich who is interviewing various staff at Pacific Whale Foundation and at Pack Whale Eco Adventures. Um, so tune into that and, and get to learn more of how we all ended up where we are today. Okay, thanks everyone for joining us. This was super fun. Um, should we do it again? Yes, we'll do it again sometime <laughs> for sure. Thanks for tuning in. If you and... want us to do it again, let us know. All right, everybody have a good weekend. Yes, have a good weekend. Stay safe, stay at home. Take care. Bye.